wild and tame in one day. This is Iceland. The birds were just singing. Now the wind is whipping. Here the stream flows through the greenery. There the lava field lies bare. You never know what's coming, but that's what makes Iceland so exciting. I'll be on the road for three weeks in the first half of June. The season is just starting. I'll not only get to know the ring road, but also gain insights into the interior of the country. I will also be spending several days in the remote west fjords. I am traveling in an anti-clockwise direction. In this first part of my film report, I will experience the south of Iceland and then reach Akureyri. This is located at the other end of the island, as seen from the airport. The thick arrows roughly sketch out the route. At the airport, I get into my rental car. After a few minutes' drive, I see smoke and fire behind the hills. Yesterday, the new volcano erupted again, and the area around the famous Blue Lagoon is closed. North of Reykjavik, I spend my first Icelandic night in a surprisingly spacious hotel room. A long balcony offers an interesting view of the mountains in the background. Zoomed in with a telephoto lens the harbor of Reykjavik. I will see Iceland's capital at the very end of my trip. The suburb of Reykjavik is not a winner in the beauty contest. I will see plenty of churches on this island. My first real day of traveling takes me along the Golden Ring, the top route for visitors from Reykjavik. Unfortunately, the weather is terrible today. The Thinkfellir National Park is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Iceland's democratic parliament was founded here around 1100 years ago. In addition, Iceland is where the Eurasian and American continental plates meet and the border runs right here. This canyon is getting wider and wider because the plates are moving apart. But it's not worth watching. The speed is at most one centimeters per year. The term geyser comes from this very phenomenon. However, it is no longer a geyser. At least it no longer erupts. The rain lashes from the side. It is seven degrees Celsius. It is not pleasant to stand here. At least you only have to wait a few minutes until the geyser called Strocker erupts. For me, the highlight of the Golden Ring is the Gullfoss Waterfall, which means Golden Fall in English. It is one of Iceland's most attractive waterfalls. The rain has increased and I am getting wet from all sides. Even my rainproof clothing is hardly helping anymore. The spray is being whipped up by the strong wind. take refuge in my car and change my clothes.
I happened to discover this waterfall by the side of the road. While several visitors are battling their way through the wet at Gullfoss, I am alone at Glugafoss. Wow, you can even get behind the waterfall and hardly get wet. Glugafoss is small but powerful. I have reached the south coast. My second home is on a large farm. The hut is surrounded by a small forest and is larger on the inside than it appears from the outside. So, komm jetzt raus. Zack. No way. The kitten stayed. I'm sorry. I don't have anything. It's probably a polar fox. My rental car has four-wheel drive, but that's not enough for the roads in the interior of the island. So today I'm getting into a super jeep. The destination of the day trip is Land Manalogger. Roadblocks are no obstacle for driver and guide Aaron. The road soon turns into a track. A great vehicle, a super jeep. We are in the lonely and inhospitable highlands. I climb to the top of a volcanic cone and enjoy the view. The road becomes muddy and narrow. 
bit uh, larger tires on it and it, of course it wasn't summertime. Uh, it's a two-wheel drive car. Aaron confidently presses the accelerator. It's mostly due to the... Normal cars would be lost when crossing such rivers. Now this river that we are crossing now is probably the river that kills the most cars in the whole of Iceland. Now that's an expensive game because you have to pay for the car. After a few hours, we reach the camp at Landman Alauger. It's supposed to be quite busy here in summer, but today we are the only ones here. You can even take a warm bath. I'll pass on that and prefer to hike through the wide river valley. Even without the sun, the rocks glow in different shades of ochre. The steam shows where the hot springs are. A hiker appears out of nowhere. He makes his way through the water and snow. Even the super jeep has to steer back and forth in the snow. There is no alternative to this route. This volcanic cone shimmers in reddish rhyolite. Aaron adjusts the tire pressure to the terrain, varying it by a factor of four. Now comes one of the most fascinating sights in all of Iceland, and yet it is so unknown. Of course, the gorge called Sigolduglufur is as remote as it is. Countless waterfalls plunge breathtakingly into the depths. If there are no dinosaurs here, then at least there are trolls. Then, messengers of civilization appear. They lead us back to the south coast. 
Selja Landsfoss is located right on the ring road. It is not particularly powerful, but it is 66 meters high. It is still very windy, as you can see from the waterfall. A slippery path leads behind the flowing curtain of Selja Landsfoss. This makes it a big brother of Glugafoss, which I've already seen. Getting wet is part of the compulsory program in Iceland, I realize now. A few minutes walk away, another waterfall is hidden behind the rocks. I crawl in and get wet again, just to be on the safe side. Oyster catchers are quite large, about 40 semidal. In 1969, a DC-3 plane flight ended badly. It happened over 700 kilometers from here. The decision was made to use this green meadow as the final resting place for the DC-3. The old bridge is now closed to cars. It no longer looks 100% solid. Another day trip with the super jeep takes us to Thorsmerk. This is a remote valley framed by three glaciers. Again, we drive through riverbeds and over rough terrain. The first glacier comes into view, but this is only the small toe of the huge Ejafjalla Jokul. The even more powerful Myrtle Jokul is ahead of us, just visible in the distance. Guide Sigi explains that the most dangerous volcano in Iceland, Katla, is dormant under this glacier. It is overdue to erupt, and when it does, the 700-meter-high ice cap will be blown away, with dramatic consequences for the villages on the south coast. Our group of four sets off from the river valley to hike to the next mountain peak. It's very strenuous, but it's worth it. There are always new and fascinating views.
After that, lunch break. We are allowed to help ourselves to two pots of soup. And once again, we are seized by wanderlust. This time, we are not climbing a steep mountain, but the river valley is no less challenging. Again and again, we have to cross the water course and get our feet wet. Then we climb to this mixture of catacomb and cathedral, a sublime sight. You can see the splashes from the waterfall, it's not rain. Enough laughing. Now I'm going to take my selfie. Guide Siggy is a ballet dancer. On the way back, I pass Celia Landsfoss again. The wind has increased further. I pack my things and set off along the south coast. The coastal plain is narrow with waterfalls thundering down steep cliffs inland. Sixty meters high, twenty-five meters wide, the Skoga Foss. It is more powerful than the Seljalands Foss, which is impressive because of its backyard. I keep stopping to admire the breathtaking scenery. I can see another glacier over there. I'll take a closer look. This too is just a branch of the great Myrdalsjökull under which the volcano lurks. This cape is the southernmost point of the main island of Iceland. From a height of 120 meters, I look out over an endless beach and snow-covered mountains in the background.
The lighthouse is almost a hundred years old. It is said that airplanes have flown through the rock gate. Unfortunately, none are flying at the moment. The rock needles on the horizon are in front of the famous Reynes Fiara Beach. I have been on the mountain ridge with the lighthouse a little while ago. Reynes Viara is famous for its black lava sand, but also for its suddenly dangerous high waves. The basalt columns are worth seeing. Overall, I find Reynes Viara overrated. This is the Church of Vic, the southernmost town on the Icelandic mainland. The road leads in a wide bend around the huge Myrtles Glacier. I find the enormous mass of snow with the rounded roof very impressive. This deep gorge not far from the Ring Road is also one of the insider tips. The bottom of the gorge is 100 meters below me. The moss-covered slopes give it a primeval character. Some of the attractions are in private hands, so access is not always possible. I continue to push eastwards. The landscape becomes even more rugged. As the Myrdals Glacier gradually merges with the horizon behind me, more snow and ice masses appear in front of me. These belong to the largest glacier in Iceland by far, the Vatnajökull. It covers 8% of Iceland's surface area and is up to 1,000 meters thick. An inconspicuous parking lot next to the ring road turns out to be an opportunity to get closer to a glacier tongue. In front of it lies the glacial lake with broken ice flows. As I continue driving, the sky suddenly opens up in front of me. The weather in Iceland often changes after just a few kilometers, but here it seems to have been nice all the time. A few minutes later, it gets even more spectacular and not just because of the sunshine. It's incredible how Vatnajökull traps the mountains with its ice masses. Hundreds of icebergs are drifting in the glacier lagoon. There are supposed to be boat tours here, but I don't see a single boat. In fact, I only see one other person who took a few photos earlier. I can't get enough of this panorama.
middle of the windswept plain, delicate plants are blooming, some of which live for decades. The next glacier lagoon is just around the corner, so to speak. Jokulsarlan is one of Iceland's main attractions, and not without reason. It is the largest lake in Iceland with a depth of almost 300 meters. It has a wide access to the mainstream of Vatnajökull. Around a million visitors flock to its shores every year, but there is hardly anyone here now perhaps because it is already late afternoon. I would like to come back tomorrow, but now I am heading for my third accommodation. This hut is located on an otherwise uninhabited headland. Visitors have to pay to enter except for guests of the accommodation. My room is simply furnished with a beautiful view of the peninsula. The buildings on the horizon belong to a NATO radar station. In a telephoto shot, a tongue of the Vatnajökull Glacier. Photographers love this area. The jagged 450 meter high mountain range in front of the black lava dunes is worth every photo. Whether my car adds to the appeal of the picture is a matter of opinion. The weather is even stormier than yesterday. There are a few houses at the foot of the mountain range, so I walk over there. It's a Viking village. Well, it's not from ancient times. It was built as a backdrop for a movie that was never filmed. The Vikings probably didn't use concrete back then either. cooking facilities are also clearly from more recent times. I drive back to Yokel Sarlan as planned. The wind is blowing with full force. Man kann überhaupt nicht aussteigen, so windig ist das. So stürmisch ist das. I am once again the only one taking the beautiful path along the Yokel Sarlon, and I now know why. A few kilometers away, there is a large paid parking lot from where you can climb a small viewing hill. Most visitors stop there 
and hike the few hundred meters, but I like it better here, in the pure nature without people. Numerous excursion boats normally cruise on this lake too. With the current storm, that is of course out of the question. The eider ducks take my presence in their stride. The white-fronted geese always keep their offspring in the middle. Where the lagoon flows into the sea is Diamond Beach. The beach is wonderfully wide, but the diamonds disappoint me. But in the sun, the chunks of ice really sparkle like precious stones. Which way does the water flow? The incoming tide creates a powerful countercurrent. When I want to drive back, I experience a blue miracle. A police barrier prevents passage. The road is closed due to the storm. In Iceland, there is usually only one connecting road, so detours are not possible. A policeman suggests that he will personally escort me to my accommodation, which is about 90 kilometers away. In a few hours. In the end, I am allowed to drive the route myself very slowly. Nobody is on the road anymore. On the way, I see a camper van that has recently been involved in an accident in the ditch. People are no longer present. I am very relieved when I reach my accommodation without any incidents. The next day I wanted to continue my journey along the ring road, but the road to the east is now also closed, without any ifs and buts. I hike without great enthusiasm on the Stocksness Peninsula where I also spent the night. In the foreground Stocksness, behind it a glacier tongue of the Vatnakokl. I cancel my booked accommodation for today. To my delight, I can book a very nice hotel in Höfn instead. Höfn is the largest city far and wide and is only 17 kilometers away. When I check in, I hear that I have got the last room. Of course, other travelers probably had to change their plans, too. Since Huffin is exposed to the sea, my room offers a wonderful view of the coast with its glacier tongues. Unfortunately, the storm has smeared the window badly. I have half a day to explore the town of 1,800 inhabitants. And lo and behold, Huffin is really great. A promenade several kilometers long leads along the seashore. Everywhere you go, you will find new and amazing views of the dramatic coastline. Only one thing doesn't change, the storm.
The hotel is situated between the sea and the harbor, which is also very attractive. All in all, I'm not at all sad that I'm stranded in Hörfen. view from my hotel room. Ich sehe, dass die Straße wieder frei ist. Morgen kann ich also los weiter Richtung Osten. I go for a walk again in the evening. Still stormy. I hope that the road won't be closed again tomorrow. I can actually continue my journey. The clouds and wind make the landscape look as rough as you would imagine Iceland to be. A stopover in a small harbor town. I have long since reached Iceland's east coast, which seems even more remote than the south. From time to time, I see individual farmsteads against an overwhelming mountain backdrop. Another place with down-to-earth charm. This small fishing village has no great attractions, but a very charming, colorful church. There are 39 single lane bridges on the ring road alone. Single lane bridges are the norm on smaller roads. Tunnels are around five to seven kilometers long. This one is dual lane, which is pleasant. The waterfall is still partly frozen, and that's in June. The landscape gives the impression that it is still in the middle of winter. Down there lies the center of Iceland's east, a metropolis with about 2,500 inhabitants. 
A mountain road leads to Seydisfjordur. The car ferry from Denmark arrives here once a week. Visitors with their own cars start their trip in Iceland here, not in Reykjavik. Cruise ships also dock here regularly. The prosperous town has thus acquired a somewhat touristy touch. On the way back, I think the weather is getting bad up ahead. I get a queasy feeling. But the storm passes me by. My accommodation is a simple hut in the interior. I had actually planned to spend two nights here, but now I have one left. I have already learned that a functioning heating system is very important, and so far I have not been disappointed. Yesterday, the connection to Akureyri on the north coast was still interrupted. The Fernseher zeigt, the meisten Straßen im Nordosten sind geschlossen, auch die Ring Road. Today, however, the ring road is open again. At least I can expect a temperature of plus one degree. The fresh snow makes the landscape seem even more inhospitable. I follow a river that is eating its way deeper and deeper into the rock. I discover a solidly constructed access point to the canyon, presumably in anticipation of an increase in visitor numbers. The 30 meter long basalt columns are around 9,000 years old. Until recently, they were still underwater. A dam project then brought them to light. glide over the plateau for hours. Hardly ever do I see another vehicle. Yesterday this road was not yet open. It is amazing how unexpectedly the sky can open up, but also how quickly the rain can start again. Unfortunately, the road to the famous Dedefoss waterfall is still closed. No chance to visit it. My wish to see the volcanic cone of Krafla is also not fulfilled. Even on foot, it is soon impossible to make any further progress. In the middle of the snow, a geothermal area. It's hard to believe that snow and 100 degree hot water can be so close together. The steam, which reaches temperatures of up to 800 degrees, contains hydrogen sulfide. If you like the smell of rotten eggs, you'll be in your element here. It bubbles and hisses everywhere. I tried it out carefully. If you get too close to the steam, it quickly gets dangerously hot.
Then I take out my black and white camera. You don't need color here anyway. The Verfjall crater extends for a kilometer and is 140 meters deep. From the edge of the crater, you have a great view of Lake Maivatn, which was formed by volcanic activity. The border between the Eurasian and American continental plates is located in Iceland. This is the reason for the volcanism and earthquakes in Iceland, and the fault line runs through this lake. The mountain road to Akureyri is closed, so I take the tunnel, which costs extra, My accommodation in Akureyri is not a romantic highlight, but a large, modern, and well-furnished apartment. From my window, I can see cruise ships coming and going. Akureyri is on the north coast and likes to call itself Iceland's capital in the north. With its 18,000 inhabitants, it is Iceland's largest city, apart from Reykjavik and its suburbs. There are many gas stations, large supermarkets, and a few apartment blocks. Large trawlers bob up and down in the extensive harbor facilities. Just outside Akureyri, there are real forests that invite you to go hiking. That is quite unusual for Iceland. I climb higher and higher and get a beautiful view of the city. However, the path becomes muddy and slippery. One of Iceland's most famous waterfalls is easy to reach from Akureyri, Gadafoss. It may only fall 12 meters, but it does so over a width of 30 meters. The Waterfall of the Gods got its name because a good 1,000 years ago, the law speaker of the time threw the old statues of the gods into the falls. They could be disposed of because Christianity had just been introduced. The landscape takes on an inviting and somewhat sublime appearance under the sun. I'm fascinated by the bright snow in the solitude.
Then I discover a beautiful little place on the fjord of Akureyri. It seems to have fallen asleep between times. Hardly any money is made from fishing anymore, but tourism does not seem to have arrived yet. I love that, and the view of the fjord is magnificent. The first half of my round trip is complete. It was great, but not everything went as planned. You have to pay much more attention to the weather in Iceland than in Central Europe. That's what I've learned. A wide, unknown terrain still lies ahead of me. The time of adventure is certainly not over yet.